Hey, okay, we're on. Ron Carter, today is uh, July 18, the year is 2018, believe it or not. We're back for some more questions, and uh, the giveaway gift this time comes from this book. There's the music of Ron Carter, Comprehensive Bass Method. And the winner of the person who guesses the song title of the bass line I'll play later on in the show gets a page from this book that has what's called a barcode. And this barcode that's a little bit, that looks like this. You scan this barcode and it takes you to my site that has me playing the example on that page. So, we're in for some good evening time and some good questions, I'm sure, on the way. Uh, by the way, today is uh, someone's birthday, whoever you are. Happy birthday to you, him, and or her. And uh, let's get on with these questions. We have a question from Spiros. Any advice for more stable improvisation? Uh, the issue with improv is, do you know the changes? Uh, and one of the problems is players who think they know the changes are, una are unable to write down the chord progressions on a sheet of paper. So I tell my students when they get to this part of playing jazz bass, in order to really have a solo that relates to the chords, obviously you gotta know the chords. So I ask them all to sit down and to take a few moments during the course of our class time and write down the changes to a tune. And I'm not surprised that most of them get past the first three bars and the rest of the page is blank. So our first job is to get the changes in our heads. And once you have the changes, you can read them on paper, memorize the shape of the tune. Your solo is supposed to replace the melody. And if you conceive of that concept of making your solo to replace that melody, you're on the right track to having a nice worthwhile solo that you can enjoy listening at some other time in your life. Brian says, I recently purchased old wine and new bottles when you played with my favorite alto, Jackie McLean. I was wondering if you could tell us uh, about your experience working with him. My, it was kind of limited, unfortunately. Jack and I were running around for a while in New York. When I came to New York, Jack was doing a show called The Connection, music by Freddie Red and Cecil Payne, a wonderful off-Broadway play about the uh, mindset of the beatniks and the uh, musicians back in the early 60s. We finally got together for a concert in Cleveland many years ago, and from that session came this recording session. Uh, I've always admired Jackie from the earlier Prestige records, the, the force with which he played the changes and the confidence he so showed in playing the melodies. I just always admired that kind of confidence in making this stuff work. Uh, as you know, he got involved with education later on in his career and the Hart School of Music, Jackie McLean, arm of that school was a, a vital force in the young musicians in Hartford. Uh, having a career outlined to him by a wonderful saxophonist and human being, Jackie McLean, and his wife, Dolly. I miss him, Jackie McLean, R.I.P. Question from Alan from Australia. In all your collaborations with Jim Hall, is there a particular recording standard that was the most memorable for you? How did you and Jim come to play in that duo highlighted in the live album Alone Together? Uh, back in the day, at the old terrible phrase, the expression, there was a club called the Playboy Club in New York on 57th Street between 5th Avenue and Madison. This building housed the, housed the Playboy Club, which had three floors of jazz music. And we could go in and hear Monty Alexander and Paul West and some great bands. Among those bands I thought were great was the Jim Hall Ron Carter duo. Uh, Orrin Keatonus came by one night and enjoyed the music and suggested that we make a record. That had never occurred to me. I was just enjoying playing with Jim Hall, man. I mean, he is one of the great guitar players of all times, and he's decided that I could be the guy to make this music sound even different. I said, so I put my bass case on and I stepped up the plate and got at least a, a single out of this deal, you know. Uh, we had a, had a nice library. We were always developing new tunes, and it seemed like Jim's job in this duo was to kind of make sketchy arrangements and my job was to try to make them work and uh, we made eight or nine records together and I'm happy with each one of them. Uh, again, Jim Hall left the concert years ago and his presence in my home and near my hi-fi equipment is as if he's still next door sending me notes about the last chorus and congratulating me on the performance he heard me play. I, we miss him. 
We have a question from Isabella Hoffman, who's a journalist and uh, wor working on a research about jazz and Brazilian music. And she's asking about how do these two genres touch each other? Well, you know, when I first had the acquaintance to meet Mr. Brazilian Music, Antonio Carlos Jobim, uh, I explained to him when we got to the session run by Cree Taylor that uh, I had never played this music before and I knew he was Mr. Brazilian Bossa Nova and I said, oh, I don't know what you want me to do. And he said, uh, Mr. Taylor, Creed, invited you to pick this music with me because he thought that you could do what the music needed. He said, well, I trust your judgment because that's your job. And then looking over the lead sheets, which I found one of the other day, Wave, the one the original title I had, I had my notes saying, these are like jazz changes. And my approach to playing this Brazilian music was to treat them like Charlie Parker recorded bebop tunes. Uh, and I found that, that I could find a nice rhythm that kind of kept the Brazilian flavor going with the American jazz bebop bass line that kind of made the melody have another level of bounce to it. Uh, I liked that experiment, and so did Creed and, and Antonio. We did several records after that, and uh, I enjoyed the harmonies he wrote. The lyrics were really interesting. I loved his piano playing and I had a great time being part of the New York bass Bossa Nova, Bossa Nova craze. Diego is asking, did, uh, have you ever forgotten the changes of a tune during a gig? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, you know, one of the things that always amazes people in my age category is that they have a really fertile memory. And, and uh, I've been more embarrassed about not remembering the complete melody. But after the chorus, I own that too. <laughs> uh, Santiago is asking, uh, when playing walking bass, do you approach, uh, how do you approach which notes to play, whether they are chord tones, scale tones, passing tones, etc., etc.? The development of my bass line depends on my partners at the time. It depends on how harmonically curious they are. Uh, if the band leader insists on having the root at the downbeat of every chorus, I'm not quite sure he's got the right guy, you know? I think the last time I played a root on the downbeat more than once was 1975. And uh, I tell those guys, if you want more roots, you have to go to the local market, because they got a lot of roots there, you know? But my, my interest is how can I convince my partners that if they trust my musical judgment, they will see where this note B in the F chord is supposed to flit, fit as they play their instruments. And, and they have to trust my sense of, I really know this song. And what I try to do, uh, my friend, is to play the song as they expect to hear it for the first chorus. I want them to know that I know this song. And the second chorus is mine. And if I can convince them that I still know this song by the second chorus, by the third chorus, they're really mine. So just get ready for this party, get on this wagon, let's get in this car, let's go for this ride. Uh, but that depends on their interest in harmony, alternate chords, and if that's not comfortable for them, they hired me to make them feel good. If you want to F all night, I'll try to go out and find some for you. I don't have any in my pocket. I kind of don't do that, but I can find some roots for your neighbor in my neighborhood grocery store, and we'll do that all night, too. I'm okay. You're getting some compliments on your <laughs> bow ties. <laughs> and we have a question from Michael, who is a fellow bassist studying music in college. Okay. And he's been dealing with a hand injury from playing, and he's been told by doctors that he ne may need surgery. Have you ever had any injuries to your hands? And if so, how did you deal with it? Uh, I heard about that the other day. I, I have a... Mulgrew Miller, my dear departed pianist, has something called a trigger finger. And that's where you have no control. The mind is sending different signals to different parts of the body and it causes the fingers, in this case, to cramp up and be uncontrollable for a short period of time. I just was aware of that last weekend. Uh, and their solution is not surgery as it is to have a, a, some hand physical therapy, acupuncture, to relieve this brain firing, misfiring, giving the muscles in the hands different signals in this case. Uh, I haven't had any hand problems at all. Uh, my issue, if I have one, 
is that when I'm off for work for about a month, my calluses disappear since I don't have many calluses, they disappear. And as you know, the calluses are caused from scraping the fingers all that on the strings. Well, after a month, my hands are like a baby's behind. You know, they're, they're pretty soft and they're not what I used to have. So it takes me a week or so of playing every night to get the calluses where they belong and my hands again feel like they belong to me. I've never had any major or minor hand issues at all. Actually, I, I spanked them when I put me to play the wrong note. They said, how could you do that to me? But other than that, I'm okay. Peter is asking, uh, which two musicians do you wish uh, you recorded, played uh, with, uh, that you never had a chance to? Uh, I have a list of two now. Ella Fitzgerald. She's a really incredible singer. And I'm sorry that I had never met her, as a matter of fact. You know? uh, I had Shirley Horn on my list, and I played with her for a record, Shirley Horn Members Miles. And, and the last person on my list uh, is Ama Jamal. Uh, I spoke to him briefly for a project that was came up overnight, and unfortunately he was already busy. But he was very pleasant, and we laughed and joked for a while and said, Mr. Jamal, oh, hold it, hold it right there. Just stop with this homework. I told your bass player that I'm going to see you guys on the road. I'm going to send him to his room to listen to the uh, loop on in CNN, and I'll play it till he got back. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see if I can convince him that's not a bad idea. He's on my list, though. <laughs> Antonio is asking, when are you going back to Rio de Janeiro? We're trying to work it out now. You know, th th there is such a financial and, and uh, uh, upheaval down there. It's difficult to make those kind of plans because the, the, the ec economy is so unstable and the political air is so fraught with things. Uh, there's an interest to get the music down there. They just haven't found a comfortable way financially to work out the details. I expect within the next seven months to get down there and try to find some Brazilian music again, though. That's my hope. We have Felipe asking, um, he said that uh, you mentioned on other interviews about the tuning of the drums in relation with the double bass. Can you refresh your thoughts about that? You know, one of the, one of the things that drummers who are out of the Tony Williams school of thought kind of missed this point of Tony's playing. Tony was very specific and very determined to have the drums tuned in such a fashion that would allow any of my notes to come through when I would play them. And uh, he would have a bass drum tuned at approximately the, uh, in the neighborhood of G. And I would say, Tony, if you get that really on G, all my notes on the E string will sound really great. Or he'd have a floor time time to tune uh, almost an A, or almost an F, and I said, Tony, that's just, too high or too low for my D-string notes I'm going to play. If you can make that drum a little bit tighter, looser, whatever it takes to make my notes on that string have a life, we can play this all night and still hear every, every, every note. And so interesting he was in sounding like he belonged to the bass player's band. And I was determined to make it sound like we belong in this band together, that, that he would take 10 minutes longer to tune the drums. It was not an issue. There was no discussion about that. Okay, let's get this done. And, and the results of that is it always felt good sonically to play at Tony Williams, not just regarding the rhythms and the form, what he played, but just the sound of the drum. It was an invitation for me to keep trying to find notes to make it work. And last question for today. What made you choose music as career? Um, that's kind of out of my, out of my answering range. Uh, if, if you bought my bio, which is for sale on my site, <laughs> uh, somewhere in there tells you how I got started. The teacher came into our public school, uh, under kindergarten to grade school, and she had this table full of instruments. She says, I'm going to help your children form an orchestra. And to make that work, here's a table full of instruments that I have available to you, and you just pick any one of those that you think you want to play. And uh, Having heard music in my house, I had no idea that that's what I was going to do or, or interested in it, but this is a chance for me to see what these things on the table did. And, and uh, as near as I can recall, when I was 11, it sounded like to me the cello seemed to have the most sound that was easiest for me to manipulate the instrument. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was a fiberglass cello, of all things, made by Sheryl Lynn Rothway back in 1950, 1948, 49, something like that. 
And uh, we decided, she agreed that it was available. No one else had taken it. And uh, I took it home for the day, and my parents said, what is that? And I said, this is a violoncello, and I'm going to try to see if I can learn how to play it. And he said, well, that requires some things from you. And I said, well, what? I got a cello. He said, well, it's a little more quiet. You got to practice every day. You got to learn some songs, and you got to be good at it. OK, sign me up. So I signed up, and here I am. <laughs> You can do the guess the baseline. Okay, now, this book is the book that has the prize song that will go to you when I play this baseline, if you guess this song that this baseline is a part of. On page 32 uh, is a song that has a barcode on it, which is notated out here. You go to this barcode with a scanner and shows me playing the song on that book. A nice, a nice uh, uh, thing to tease you to get my book. It's very successful. I've been teaching out of it for like four months, finally. And it's working out very well. So I'm going to go to my bass, and I pick up the instrument and play a, a couple of two courses of a song. And the winner gets page 32 of this book. Just the page, not the book. We have Alexis done of There Will Never Be Another You. Yeah. Well, page 32 comes to your house. OK, well, this is our, our talk for the day. We'll be here uh, approximately a month from now. And uh, keep those cards and letters coming. Still available to you is this book that someone just won the prize for. There's also a, a bio book of mine and an audio book. So please feel free to. Come to the site and order those three items. I thank you for spending the time with us today, and we'll be back a month from now. Bye.